I'm so excited that you're here with us tonight. Thank you for, for tuning in to, to Church of the Open Door Live. I still wish we were doing church together, and we are. It's just not in the same geographic location, but I believe for the power and presence of God to come to right where you are tonight. I've just got a few things to share, and but let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Father, we love you. I thank you, Lord, for each one that you've reaching, you're reaching out to, Lord, and embracing with your grace. Let your word of truth go forth tonight. Let it be received, Lord. Filter through whatever needs to be for each of our lives, our hearts, as we go forward in you. In Jesus' name, amen. And let me share, if I can, for just a moment, kind of a humorous story uh, with different holidays being celebrated as they are throughout the year. Uh, so many of them have connections with Christianity, uh, like Christmas, obviously Easter that we're coming up on, even Thanksgiving has a, certainly a, a spiritual connotation with it as well. But I heard of one man that was uh, had some complaints. He just felt like there are really no holidays commemorating atheism. And if you happen to be watching today and you're identifying with or are sympathetic to this atheist complaint uh, that there's not a day on the calendar that highlights atheism, um, I want to encourage you. Today is your day on the calendar. Actually, today is April 1st. It's often referred to as April Fool's Day. Now, I'm not the first one that defined it that way, not the original one to assign the title of fool, but Isaiah, I mean, Psalms 53, 1 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So uh, this is your day, but I trust that before this time is over, you can find out who the real God is, and I encourage you to do that. I want to take a moment to thank those of you that are part of Open Door for your faithfulness in giving during this time that we're not physically meeting together your faithfulness in tithing and giving offerings, understanding that the, the ministries of the church go on, the missions that we support, that still continues. Uh, remind you, there are three different ways you can give. One is online uh, through our website, opendoorwaco.org, uh, through PayPal. And you don't even have to sign up for PayPal to be part of that. But you can give. Uh, honestly, my first time giving that way was only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but it works, and it was pretty well painless, and I still got my, my seed sown into the kingdom of God. Second way you can give is simply through uh, snail mail, through the mail, uh, sending it to the church address. The third way is we've got a drop box to the left of the main entrance. Actually, outside from the porch area is a mail slot, uh, a drop box. It's secure, and uh, a number of you have taken advantage of that, and and again, I just thank you for doing that. And may God continue to reap, let, allow us to reap a harvest, you to reap a harvest through the seed that you continue to sow. I just want to take a few minutes tonight and encourage you with a message on, uh, it really is the first words of a psalm that we'll study tonight. It's, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. And, and maybe in your environment and maybe uh, whatever your circumstances are specifically right now, it's not a feeling of blessing the Lord. It's not some overwhelming uh, impetus to do so. But tonight, we're going to make a choice. I will bless the Lord. I'm reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 34. If you're jotting down notes, you can note that. The psalmist David, and he says simply first one, he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. As I begin to study this passage more in depth, I found some things, discovered some things I've not seen before when he says, I will bless the Lord. Uh, I, I have noticed this, but I, I'll share it with you again. He said, I will, not I feel. If we're governed by feelings, it may be our praise, our blessing the Lord may be fewer and farther between than it should be. But David said, I will. And the word I will bless, bless means adore. It, it would mean, one posture would be to kneel 
before the Lord. It means to praise. But when you use that phrase together, I will bless the Lord. The Hebrew, the original language of the Old Testament that's used here in this phrase, it's, it's in the imperfect aspect. It, it can mean this, an action or a process or a condition which is incomplete. It's, it's not something I did, I blessed the Lord, I checked the bless the Lord checkbox, and I'm done, once and done kind of deal. No, it says, I will bless the Lord. It means that ongoing, that action or process or condition which is incomplete. I will go ahead and bless the Lord. I'll continue blessing the Lord. For David says in the next part of that verse, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. That Hebrew word means it's a permanent part. It's a daily part. It's a regular or unceasing part of my life. May that be our testimony. I will bless the Lord at all times, every circumstance. His praise will continually be in my mouth. And then in verse 2, he says, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Let's stop at that first half of that. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. I, I didn't realize that's that, that Hebrew word again, halal, where we get the word hallelujah from. It means to celebrate, shine, to, to make a boast of, to make a fool of. Actually, be so expression of, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. And he says, the humble shall hear it. The humble shall hear it of it and be glad. Uh, our, our real praise is for more than our own personal benefit. Yes, it will benefit us. But he said, while I'm doing my praise to God, the humble shall hear it. Uh, the, the word humble there, it refers to the needy or the weak, the afflicted. Actually, the root of that word means even the depressed. They'll hear that and be glad. The, 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 what a right now season for you and for me to both walk in the peace of God and then exhibit a, a lifestyle, an attitude of real praise, which lifts up those around us. I don't mean that we have to have a giddiness about us or, or, or a fake smile on all the time, but an attitude of gratitude lifts us up and at the same time, because of that, it says that the, those down around us will be lifted up in that same way. The humble will hear of it and be glad. But look at the invitation of David. That he goes on and he extends to those that are around him. And it should be reflective of what we're doing as well. Verse 3 of Psalms 34, he says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let, let's exalt his name. Look, look how our lives are to be lived in that kind of worship together. He says, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Magnify, that word means to be large. And someone the other day, they got pretty excited because they picked up a magnifying glass from the dollar store. They found out they could read their Bible a lot more easily than before. Now, when we were kids, get a magnifying glass. I'm just trying to burn some leaves or do something, see how that'll work. But magnifying, in this context, I realize it's it's not. It doesn't mean that by magnifying the Lord, some way we're making Him larger than He is. I mean, He's Almighty God, the Exalted One. But we, as we magnify Him, as is referred to here. We began like that one, that brother that bought the magnifying glass. He could see a lot more clearly. When we magnify the Lord, we begin to see him in a lot better focus than before. I read a story a while back uh, of a little boy with his dad, and they had looked together at airplanes flying in the sky, the little specks there, of course. But one that day, the dad took his son out to see one of those big jets up close, and the son says something like, wow, Dad, it, it's so huge, but it looks so small way up there. And the dad said, the, the way you see it depends on how close you are to it. 
So let's, it, it's sort of like life. God, the closer I am to him, the greater that I see he is. And we look at God as though he's distant and far off. Our problems can really seem so huge. The current crisis that we're in as a, a nation and the flood of news sources that I, I just encourage you, don't, don't engage in 24-7 in, in consuming those things. But those things can seem loom so ominous in front of us, so huge, and, and they become so fear-inducing. But if we can let our perspective line up with what reality really is, we see the greatness and largeness of our God. We'll be like that little boy on the runway. Wow, my God is so big. He's so huge. David, in the setting of this psalm, he was in a dangerous position. Uh, but he could see, see the need of magnifying the Lord, exalting him. Look at verse 4 of Psalms 34. He said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I asked him, I sought him, and he heard me, delivered me from all my fears. How powerful that is. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but drop down with me to verse 7 as he continues. He says, The angel of the Lord encounters all around those who fear him. The word encounters is to pitch a tent. I thank God for his covering over us that are his children. The angel of the Lord encounters all around those who fear him and delivers them. In verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hear this. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman, the person who trusts in him. Let me go back to verse 4. I sought the Lord. He heard me, delivered me from all my fears. Listen, many even believers in this season in which we are are dealing with fear. I, I, I mean an extreme fear and a panic. The panic that kind of sets on your chest. Makes it hard to breathe at times as I've heard people talking about that. And I'm talking about that which is beyond just reasonable concerns or practical precautions. Precautions that we should take. You know, there are many that are facing tormenting spirits of fear even at this time. And some are uncomfortable with the term demon, but, but really those terms spirit uh, or demon can be used interchangeably in the context that I'm presenting. They're synonymous, but 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit, a demon, of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That that those two are sound mind. It's the only place in the New Testament that that Greek word is used. It's a combination of two words. It's a call to soundness or God-empowered discipline. When the pressure fe feeling comes, when the attack comes, don't yield over to that spirit behind fear. See, what I need to point out tonight, I believe, to engage with some of you that are have been facing this even in a repeated way. Maybe you've been come under even a bondage to that spirit. I want to encourage us to actively resist the very spirit of fear that I see so rampantly operating around our country today. But resist that spirit of fear with the same tenacity that you would resist other temptations of the enemy. In the book of James, Chapter 4, verse 7, that's James 4, 7. He says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There are three verbs found in that verse. The first two are us, our responsibility. He said, submit to God, number one. Number two, resist the devil. And the third word, the verb, is the reaction from those spirits when we do Number one and number two, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. What I'm saying is resist the spirit of fear like you would resist other spirits, the spirit behind immorality, spirit behind addiction, the pull of those things. One of the sisters earlier this week woke up in the middle of the night, felt real impressed by God to uh, post something out there as an encouragement 
to someone who was having a pull of temptation. And let me just read a couple of paragraphs of what she said. Uh, she said, and specifically, she believed someone needed to hear it. And I've gotten a testimony back already, somebody that did need to hear it. But she said this, with all this extra time alone and away from other believers, the enemy's working extra hard in our minds, especially in the areas of past addictions. I know because I can relate. Let me say something parenthetically. She knew what it was to be in, a, in an addictive lifestyle and have another resource uh, to try to calm down and try to do all those things, deal with pressure. She says, I, I know because I can relate. She goes on in writing. She says, no matter how long you're sober, the enemy still tries to find you in a weak moment to open that door again. You're not alone. Stay connected with other believers by phone. Stay in the Word. I love her advice here. Listen to only Christian music a lot. Find some good teaching of the Word. She recommends our Facebook and YouTube uh, channel. The enemy's pull can be very strong at times, but we have the Holy Spirit in us who is much stronger. Know that I'm praying for you. That's a good word of encouragement. That's one of, uh, that when the pull of temptation, whether it's towards something literally that way or another direction, even toward fear, remember that 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5 still applies. It's a promise that's so valid for us. Let me share it with you. You can look it up yourself as well. But the Word of God says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's the important part. Take the way of escape. Another way the Bible teaches, uh, sometimes it's exiting a situation. But the, another way the Bible teaches that we are to deal with temptation is, is by actually verbally using the Word of God, Scripture. Jesus demonstrates it to us in both the book of uh, Matthew chapter 4 and, and Luke chapter 4. It's recorded in both of those Gospels. Jesus keeps, a, he repeats three times, it is written. The Satan comes to tempt him in the wilderness in an area, and Jesus says, it is written. And he quotes the Bible, the Old Testament, the only written Word of God available then. But I'm telling you, we can apply the same strategy as it relates to us resisting temptations that the enemy would seek to get us to enter into, including the temptation to fear. I just need to stay there before I close. To give place, to not give place to a spirit of fear. It reminds you of a, just a few verses that will help us be established here. You can use these verses Pull the sword out of the sheath, the sword of the Word of God. John 14, 27, Jesus spoke these words. He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Look at the two things that Jesus said about peace here. He said, I give it to you and I leave it with you. Both of those words in the original language are in the present tense and in the active verse. When fear tries to come in or overtake, when do I need the peace of God right now, presently? And it's the power of God that brings it to me because it's in the active uh, voice of that language. What Jesus is presently giving us by his power is peace, not like the world gives. And let me clarify something. I, I really believe that we can not only take the peace of God that he gives to us, but we can retain it even in unsettling or difficult circumstances. I, I would prefer that every storm we face, including this current one, could be dealt with the same way that we talked about when Jesus and his disciples were in the boat. I think we maybe talked about it uh, last Sunday. When Jesus simply stood up and he said, Peace, 
be still. And the wind stopped and the wave ceased. But I want to say that that's not always the way that we see God dealing with storms in the Bible or in our own lives either. Again, sometimes the settling of the storm is a process, a longer process. But don't forget, even in the storm, Jesus has given us a possession of his present peace. That's the promise to a believer. John 16, 33, the same gospel that we just read from. John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll still have trouble or you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Look at this qualifier. Jesus said, in me you'll have peace. I believe God's been speaking to some people. I know he has because I've been in communication with some that you've not been in that position uh, spiritually of in Christ. You pull back discouragement, distraction, and you're battling fear and you're trying to even battle it on your own. Now I'm telling you, I believe that God is calling people unto himself, to this same Prince of Peace. That's what in the book of Isaiah, who Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He's calling you today. I believe he's really doing that. And some of you had a grandmother that's been praying for you. You had a mom that was on seeking the Lord for you. And uh, God has not been ignoring those prayers. Maybe they're already with the Lord, but he's reaching out to you today. And if you will, take a moment with me before in, uh, in just a few minutes. I want to share a few other things, but I, before I close, I want you to stop and, and pray with me. And in whatever words that you use, I want you to understand the promise of God. Jesus is referred to in John 1, 12, says, To as many as received Jesus, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. This moment, your time of receiving, repenting if you've been running from God, repenting, receiving the truth of what Jesus did on the cross. He died. He rose again. He said if we'd repent, open the door of our heart and come in, make us new. Lord Jesus, come in my life. I surrender and I'm through with my running. I give myself to you and I ask you to be Lord over my life, Savior over my life. I give ownership to you from this point forward empower me I make the choice to surrender to you in Jesus name amen and the promise then as a child of God and the struggle that you've had with fear and so many levels of tormenting fear now you take the word of God that he said I've told you these things so in me you'll have peace and even child of God if uh, now those that even said yes to the Lord, you qualify for this. But maybe there's other believers that you just, when you lay down at night and your mind begins to stir up and again the pressure comes, I'll, I'll share one more passage with you. It's Psalms 4.8. David says this and we can apply it to ourselves as well. In peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. We can say that. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. During this present season in this world, we're going to keep submitting to God. We're going to keep resisting the devil. And we're going to keep declaring the word of God. Father, I thank you for your incredible peace that we take tonight. The peace that your word says surpasses our understanding. A peace that even in an intellectual way doesn't make sense but it's a peace that comes from you because as Prince of Peace we put our faith and confidence in you thank you Lord for that being the case in homes that maybe with the upsettingness of shifting schedules and uncertainty of some things let your peace prevail for moms for dads for single men for single women for young people let your peace come let your peace cover the family unit. And, oh, God, that when we rise up, it will be with a choice to bless you 
when we rise up, when we sit down, when we come in, when we go out, reestablish us, O oh God, in the power of your presence day after day. We thank you and we honor you for it in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you. We look forward to what the Lord has yet to accomplish in and through each of us. Amen.